This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community of thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. To get a free two-month trial, use my link in the description. This is a graveyard, historic Rose Hill Cemetery in my city of Macon, Georgia. I love this place. Every time I come here, I come away renewed in my faith in science, or let's say trust, renewed in my trust in science. I'll tell you why I am renewed in that here before we're done. I make videos about food and cooking, and in that pursuit I often consult science and scientists on common questions like, is it safe to cook with Teflon? Why are some people more or less sensitive to spicy foods? Does alcohol really burn off when you cook it? Why do pizza steels make crispier, browner pizza than pizza stones? Is dietary fat actually bad for you? Is MSG actually bad for you? Why does boxed cake taste so different from scratch cake? Should you wash meat before you cook it? And most times when I do this, I get somebody asking me why I am so willing to accept the scientific consensus. Sure, most people who study these things might believe that eating a big chip of Teflon would do nothing bad to you or just pass through your system, but what if they're wrong? You can always find a dissenting opinion, and the scientific consensus has a history of being wrong. And I'm not just talking about super old stuff like geocentrism or classical elements theory. That's the idea that all matter is composed of some ratio of air, earth, fire, and water, easily disproven in the 18th century because that's not how any of this works. I'm not just talking about that stuff. Modern science has a history of getting things wrong, too, like drugs that we thought were safe until it turned out they weren't. The classic case would be thalidomide. Thalidomide is a popular drug to this day, used to treat cancer and skin problems and other things. In the 1950s, it was marketed as a morning sickness drug, which it turned out was causing terrible birth defects. Birth defects in as many as 20,000 children all around the world. That crisis led to many of the pharmaceutical industries regulations that we now take for granted today. In food, we have the great 20th century fat fallacy. When I was a little kid and my dad was about the age that I am now, maybe a little bit older, he went to the doctor and his doctor said, you've got high cholesterol. If you don't take down your saturated fat intake, you're going to have a heart attack and you're going to die. So we stopped eating butter at home. We started having margarine instead, and we stopped eating steak so often. When we did have steak, it was these super lean cuts of sirloin that my dad would get, which by the way, Brits, when Americans talk about a sirloin, that's part of what you call the rump. What you call a sirloin is what we generally call the strip steak. But anyways, medical science regarded butter and red meat as the great dietary evils until it turned out that the butter substitutes we were using with trans fats in them are actually way worse for us. And then just now, in the last few months, new research has come out indicating that the links between red meat and cancer and heart disease are far more tenuous than what was commonly believed. As published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, quote, the magnitude of association between red and processed meat consumption and all cause mortality and adverse cardiometabolic outcomes is very small, and the evidence is of low certainty. We shouldn't be mad about this. Science is an iterative process. Research builds upon research that builds upon research. We gradually learn more and more, and we get smarter and smarter and smarter. And if we're smarter now, that necessarily means that we were dumber before. And when you're dumber, you're more likely to get things wrong. And of course, not all the mistakes are innocent. Science is susceptible to manipulation. The Australian obstetrician William McBride was widely credited with figuring out that thalidomide causes birth defects. It was actually a midwife that he worked with named Pat Sparrow, who first made the connection. It's a fact that he conveniently omitted, but anyways. Twenty years after all that, Dr. McBride tried for a comeback hit when he published a 1981 paper linking another morning sickness drug with birth defects, Dibendox. Turned out he deliberately falsified his data, and that drug remains in use today under different names, and it is widely considered safe and effective. And of course, money influences science. The person perhaps most singularly responsible for linking fat consumption with heart disease was Dr. D. Mark Hegstead, a nutritionist at Harvard. In 2016, Hegstead was named in the Journal of the American Medical Association as being among those researchers who were paid by the sugar industry. They were paid to find something, anything other than sugar, to blame for heart disease. So with all its flaws, why am I so willing to accept the scientific consensus and to pass it on to you? Because it's the best we've got because it's simply illogical to go with anything else. Science represents the best available knowledge we have at any given moment. 
I'm not qualified to question the scientific consensus, and you probably aren't either. This is not a super comfortable argument for me to make, because I'm generally down with questioning authority and encouraging other people to question authority. But I try to only question things that I have grounds or qualifications to question. In the journalism world that I came from, there's a guy named David Folkenflik. He's a reporter for NPR, that is the nominally public public radio network that we have here in the United States. Anyway, David coined this term that he calls an earned opinion. In the mid to late 20th century, it was pretty much common practice that mainstream reporters in the United States would keep their opinions to themselves. They would only say facts. Now we've gotten into a period where things are very, very different, and we could argue all day about whether that's a good thing, but all David was trying to say is that, like, look, if we're going to say what we think instead of just what we know, let's reserve that for when we have earned the opinion. When it's a story that we have put a ton of work into, and we've really learned the facts, and we've done all the investigation, really what we think kind of matters. We've earned it. That's an earned opinion. A few years ago, I tried to augment David's coinage by coining the antonym, asshole opinions. Call them asshole opinions not just because they are so often voiced by people who are themselves assholes, but also because asshole opinions are like assholes in the sense that everybody has one. If you've been researching a scientific topic for years and you think that the scientific consensus has it wrong, you've earned that opinion. And if it's about food, I want to hear that opinion. I want to put it into a video. Although I will tell my audience that it's a minority opinion so they can contextualize it as such. But if all you've done is spent a couple hours listening to some fringe theorist rant on Joe Rogan's show, then you've not earned an opinion. That there is an asshole opinion you got there. I think sometimes that when people say they don't believe the scientific consensus, What's really going on is that they're just opposed to what people want to do about that consensus. The giant example would be climate change, right? There remains scientific consensus that the planet is getting warmer and that human activity is a significant causal factor. You might disagree with that, but unless you are an accomplished climatologist, I don't really care what your opinion is. You shouldn't care what your opinion is. It's an asshole opinion. And maybe deep down inside you know that. You know that the science is there. You're just opposed to the politics that flow from the science. But if we accept that scientific consensus that the planet is getting warmer and that we're causing it to some extent, it does not necessarily follow that we should all just push our cars into the sea and start weaving baskets in vegan agrarian communes. I mean, that might actually be the best response, but there are other conceivable responses as well, like trying to eat less beef and dairy. Beef might not be all that bad for you after all, but cow farts still account for a substantial chunk of human-caused warming, says science. Or another response could be to do absolutely nothing about your carbon footprint and just rely on science to provide technological solutions to climate change. For what it's worth, that's really the only thing I have hope for anymore. Not that you should care about my opinion, because my opinion doesn't matter. I haven't earned it. Or maybe you think you have earned your opinion, not through rigorous scholarship perhaps, but maybe through good old-fashioned common sense. I don't need any of that fancy book learning. I've got common sense. Well, the problem with that is that science has proven time and time again that reality is weird. What is true, what is empirically true, is often really different from what common sense would predict. A perfect example in the food world is the searing myth. In 1847, German chemist Justus von Lieberg wrote that you can mitigate moisture loss when cooking meat by quickly cooking the exterior surface. Quote, the albumin immediately coagulates from the surface inwards, and in this state forms a crust or shell. The flesh retains its juiciness. I think part of the reason why that myth persists to this day is that it just makes sense. Common sense. For millennia, doctors have stopped bleeding by cauterizing wounds, right? You apply a lot of intense heat, and that coagulates the blood coming out of the blood vessels, and the bleeding stops. It makes sense that the same thing would basically happen with muscle tissue when you cook it. Except it just doesn't. You can disprove this notion empirically, as people have been doing since not long after Escoffier popularized von Lieberg's myth. You take two steaks, you weigh them, you sear one of them, you cook them both to the same internal temperature, and then you weigh them again. Searing does not seal in juices. It just doesn't. Common sense is great when it's the best you've got, and it often is. Science has not addressed every single question you might have in your life. But when there is some science to address a question that you have, that's going to be your best bet, and not the the common sense. This brings us back to why I'm talking to you from this historic cemetery, Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon, Georgia. 
I love this place. If you like that southern gothic vibe, come walk around here. It goes on forever. Look around for a while and you'll start to notice a lot of very small grave markers. This little lamb is Carrie Burke, died 1867, 11 months old. Here's little Charlie Sassnett, died 1883, he wasn't quite two. Martha Winship, 1881, she lived a week. Look at all the dead children. They're everywhere. And this was the fancy cemetery in the 19th century. Macon's elite families are buried here. Many of them would have been slave owners. They had the best food, shelter, and sanitation, and even they couldn't save their babies. The near global collapse of infant and childhood mortality rates over the last century was achieved by science. Science saved the babies. I want to make every anti-vaxxer walk around this place with me for a few hours. Here's one grave marker for two sisters, Annie and Fanny. They each lived a year and they were born three years apart. They never met. That kind of thing almost never happens anymore to families with access to modern medicine. Without science, my first son would have lived about a minute. He couldn't breathe when he came out. I would have set him under one of these little stone cradles and that would have been the end of his story. But thanks to science, he's five now and he's making pancakes with me. That is why I believe in science. If you've got something better to which you would like to entrust your children, do let me know about it. I believe in science, and more broadly, I believe in expertise. And there are literally thousands of experts just waiting to transfer their knowledge to you on Skillshare, the sponsor of this video. There's classes there covering all kinds of creative and entrepreneurial skills, including literally all of the skills that I'm using right now. Like check out Sorel Amore's new class on how to build a successful YouTube channel. Today's class is all about how to grow your online presence to be of a million or more. But the difference is I'm gonna teach you how to do it authentically so that you have a long-term career ahead of you and not just gone in a flash. Indeed, I think I've found in my own work that the more I let myself just be myself, the more clicks I get. And this is a key point that I really wanted to make in this video, not just in the context of a Skillshare ad. There's lots of ways of achieving expertise. Conventional schooling is a good one, but it is but one of them. And Skillshare classes compared to conventional schooling are an absolute steal. After your two month free trial, a whole year of unlimited access is less than $10 a month. Use my link in the description to get that trial. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. Also in the description is a link to another video that I made here in Rose Hill Cemetery, me and a former student of mine named Burgess Brown. The Allman Brothers Band used to hang out and write songs in this cemetery, and they wrote a beautiful tune called Little Martha. may have been inspired by Little Martha Ellis's grave here. We arranged the piece for string quartet, and we shot a performance of it right here. I hope that you'll have a look and a listen. I'm really proud of that one.